All right, folks, we do have a lot to cover today in the ways of content of information. So I'm going to actually just kick it off. I do see the numbers ticking up. So appreciate people joining. Uh, this is part of our EMS week sort of series, but I'm happy to say that I'm not running this show. <laughs> so to reintroduce myself, because I know I recognize a lot of the names on this uh, list. My name is Khalid Kazi. I am the Senior Manager of Training and Safety here for the EMS Department at Mount Sinai for the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, we have a great topic today uh, covering injury prevention mainly, but it's going to be a bit more involved in the sense of we'll do a bit of a case study and then we're going to allow our experts to sort of break out further upon it. I'm joined today by uh, members of the Selikoff Center uh, for Occupational Health. I will let them explain what exactly they do because it's extremely interesting and there's a lot to it. Uh, I am uh, I have have with me Dr. Yelena Globina, uh, Arlette Lauser, and uh, Michael Gormley. And wonderful group of folks that I've been working closely with for actually multiple years now on this extremely important topic. What I do appreciate about the presentation that's going to kick off today is that this is not a rehash of what you saw in EMT or paramedic school. This is not a rehash of other presentations where they tell you the same thing over and over. This really goes, I would say, into the medicine of what we're trying to do, which is what I think a lot of you are seeking, right? What are some of the clinical aspects we want to look at? What are some of the philosophies we want to follow? And then the idea that we got to break out of this complacency where we are sort of invincible in our jobs till we're not invincible. So I'm going to leave it to the expert panel here to sort of cover what we, how to improve our industry as a whole to make sure we have a long career injury free. So I shall now turn it over to Dr. Globina. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, for this opportunity, first of all, and your kind introduction, Khalid. Um, so I, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, I would like to reemphasize that this is really um, a collaboration uh, between our two departments, and uh, we continue to work closely together to offer our expertise in injury prevention to everyone in this audience and beyond, of course. Next slide. And these are the presenters today. Next slide. So I, I wanted to say a couple of words on what we do at the Celical Centers for Occupational Health. We are part of the Mount Sinai Health System, as Khalid had mentioned, and our clinic is specialized uh, to provide uh, healthcare to injured workers, uh, to educate uh, workers on how to keep workplaces safe, work practices safe and healthy. We diagnose and treat occupational injuries. We assess occupational exposures, uh, exposures that may be respiratory, or dermal or injuries uh, related to ergonomic exposures, among others. And of course, we have a really comprehensive uh, scope of care that we provide at the Selikov Centers, and that includes social workers that can help with benefit management and assist with navigation of a very complex New York State workers' compensation system. Next slide. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention in the previous slide is that we have four different locations and we'd be happy to share uh, more information about our clinics later if anybody is interested. Um, today though, we will focus on a few objectives for today's presentation for the AMS week. Um, first one is I will present a case to set the stage, a case that is actually quite common and you'll probably recognize uh, the exposures. Um, my colleagues will talk about injury risks. Uh, they will talk about incident reporting. Um, they will discuss ergonomic exposures and job tasks, as well as how to approach uh, body posture and mechanics, as well as patient handling 
in a safe manner so that slips, trips, falls, and drops can be prevented. Uh, really, the goal is to prevent injury and also how to build a team um, that is focused on the culture of safety uh, that Khalid has presented. That is perhaps the most challenging task. And uh, without further ado, I'll jump right in. Next slide, please. So to set the scene, um, I wanted to give a case presentation of a 36-year-old male emergency medical provider uh, who is in moderate shape. This is a real case. Um, the emergency medical provider was attending to a patient um, and uh, they had to respond to a call at a home that was very cluttered had very little space. Um, and the challenge was to transfer a patient who was bed bound and unresponsive, as well as very heavy at 210 pounds in a setting where a stretcher couldn't be brought into the apartment. So a stair chair was placed on the left side of the bed uh, to assist uh, the transfer of the patient to the bed, to the stair chair and onward. Next slide. So what happened? Um, there were two partners on the scene, uh, one of which was on the right side of the bed, kneeling on the edge of the bed to help move the patient. We had our injured emergency medical technician who reached across the bed uh, to pull the patient towards them. And the injured emergency medical technician was wearing uh, the airway bag on his back. And so in the process of reaching, kneeling, pulling, the equipment that the injured emergency medical provider was wearing changed his center of gravity, creating an awkward reach position and challenging his balance. Next slide, please. As a result of this, uh, he developed acute pain in his shoulder. Uh, and after the call, uh, the emergency medical provider was advised to fill out an incident report appropriately, submitted to his direct supervisor. And uh, then he went to get, uh, sorry, they went to get um, to, went to get an evaluation by a private doctor who had diagnosed them with shoulder strain. And so this unfortunately resulted in uh, one week of sick leave away from work uh, for the injured emergency medical technician uh, due to the right shoulder strain. And of course, this is a common scenario among emergency medical providers, which really begs the question uh, that I will hand off uh, to my colleague Arlette um, on the next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arlette Lozier, and I'm an ergonomist and a therapist. And I'm going to start by asking you a question. Um, we're going to pull up a poll question to ask if you've ever sustained an injury on the job and missed one day or more because of the injury. It doesn't have to be severe, back strain, neck spasm, ankle strain, sprain. Um, but if we can pull up the poll, we'll see um, what we have and you have about two minutes to complete the poll. Okay, thank you everyone for participating. Now let's see what, who we have in the audience anonymously and, and how many people have gotten injured. So, wow, okay, this is such important information for all of us. Uh, we have 59% of our attendees today um, who have said that they've been out for at least one day or more with some kind of work related injury, some kind of uh, discomfort. And we have 41% um, that says no. Um, more than half 
is significant from my perspective as someone who works with injured employees and the workforce. And we have 125 people who are on today. So that is significant. Thank you for the poll. Um, so with that in mind, and then also given the case that Dr. Globina started with, I'd like to move forward and talk a little bit about what we're dealing with. Um, I know you're out in the field every day and you're busy doing your jobs and just recovering from each day and, you know, resting up and for, for the next one. Um, so today's an opportunity to really talk a little bit about what's happening, how many, who, and what kind of um, strategies can be implemented to help this along um, because of working in a high-risk job. So we have data from 2017 from the CDC. And what I thought was really interesting to share is who had the most injuries um, you know, oftentimes we'll say, oh, it's only the older workers, but actually what the trends are showing, and we're, we're hoping for some um, new data to come up soon from the CDC and NIOSH, that younger workers are also getting injured. Um, there's uh, generally a perception, no, I won't get hurt because I'm young, my body's in great shape. But actually, as the experience is built, that is what helps to start to decrease the intensity of the injuries as well as the frequency. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. So we have both ends of the spectrum. We have younger workers and then we have the aging workers. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So something that you know and you live every day is the job hazard um, quota, um, the quotient, What that it's unpredictable and highly physical. But what I hope that you'll do today is to think about the case, let's say, that Dr. Globina was starting with because we're using that as something very functional or maybe something you did yesterday. The unpredictability and the highly physical nature of your job is considered a job hazard, an ergonomic exposure. Um, you're providing fast-paced care. Uh, you don't have a chance to think about how do you take care of yourself before you take care of others. Lifting and moving of patients and equipment or both at the same time? And what does that do to your body? How much does that intensify the risk? Um, many of you have multiple jobs and are out in the community and you have other roles and volunteer. Um, shift work by nature is intense and creates increased job stress. Um, the extended hours, um, the work stress, and of course, um, if you have to cover someone else's shift, uh, that also um, lends to the unpredictability as well as um, increased fatigue, and fatigue leads to stress. Um, also, we find that there's a huge range of EMS provider uh, fitness levels. Um, some people are out running, some people are going to the gym every day, some people are doing very, very little and consider their jobs a way to be strong, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, other job hazards are the wear and tear on your joints and your muscles and your discs and your back. Um, and um, of course, we talked a little bit ago about the less experienced workers and the older workforce being at the highest risk. And then of course, treating patients with infectious illness is a job hazard. Next slide, please. Okay. So what we're going to do today is to layer on the thought process of those job hazards and talk about what's your personal risk. So it's an opportunity for you to sit here for this 45 minute session um, to think about what is your own personal risk for injury and what can you do about it? So how old are you? Um, what is your body type? Are you hyperflexible? Are you very muscular? Um, do you, are you lanky? You know, there, I'm not using um, very medical terms today, but you know that traditionally, you know, throughout your childhood, as you got older, uh, you went to school, you, you know, you, you thought about your body and now you're in this very challenging job. So perhaps you've never had an injury. You're part of that in the 40% group. Possibly you've had an injury and you're in that over 50% group who's here today. What's your injury history? Is it totally gone? And do you do something to stay strong? day to day to compensate for that injury? Do you ever hear from it? You know, is it that bum knee or that, oh, I have a little back problem? Or you know what, I can never lean on my knee because um, if I put pressure on my patella, it's very sore. Um, what is your personal um, physical condition? Um, are you doing anything to um, 
take care of your body. I'm I'm not that one who sends people to the gym every day, although I think I'm slowly, um, as I work with more and more um, EMS providers, I find that I want to encourage people to really um, take better care of their bodies if they can and to pick out what's relevant to them. Um, what is your stress level and how does that impact on how you can take care of yourself? And then what is your lifestyle? And lifestyle means something different to everybody. So um, if you just tune in for a moment and you think about whether it's your activity level, whether it's um, how much sleep you get, um, you know, do you have recovery periods? That all feeds into personal risk. Next slide, please. So another opportunity, ask yourselves, what do you do if you're injured? Um, and everybody has a different perception of what it means I'm injured. Some people, you know, consider a strain an injury. Some people don't. It's um, really relative to your own thought process. So what I want to encourage you today is to think a little bit more deeply. How do you know the severity of your injury? Um, you know, sometimes it really takes diagnostics in order to find out that severity. And sometimes it takes the pain not going away on the weekend that takes that uh, moment where you say, you know, maybe I should get checked out. Um, I encourage you, if you walk away with nothing else today, if your gut is telling you that maybe there's something that's not going away and it continues to visit you or on the weekends, it's interfering with your function or nighttime or it interferes with your sleep, then get it checked out. That That is our recommendation um, because best news, there's nothing going on. It's a, it's a short strain, maybe a little micro tear. And then other scenarios, maybe you need to go for some physical rehab, maybe some physical therapy, occupational therapy, whatever will help you to get back to a functional level of strength so you can be fit for duty. Um, but that's the reason to go for physical rehab. And um, the other reason is to understand that, um, you know, once you have that weak link and you need and you get back to your normal space in terms of your physical performance, how do you prevent an injury reoccurrence? Um, you know, we have different strategies, but the one I will tell you that is most effective, if you do have an injury and you go for physical rehab, the best way to prevent an injury reoccurrence is to look at what in, how you got injured to begin with, and also to continue with the regimen pro provided to you by your therapist. Um, even if you pick 50% of it, um, try to hold on to it so that, you know, after the honeymoon period of three months of rehab, you start to feel a little bit of the ache coming back. You know that that home exercise program or those stretches that you need to do are something you need to make a part of your daily life. And then, of course, the early intervention is key. Um, the quicker you get a diagnosis, uh, the better off you'll be so that the inflammation um, doesn't uh, get worse. Next slide, please. Um, this takes us right into the conversation about incident and injury reporting. There are tremendous benefits um, to reporting. And the first question is, um, do you know, are you infinitely familiar with your organization's guidelines of incident reporting? Who do you contact first? Um, who do you contact second? Uh, what if you can't get in touch with someone? These are great questions for your managers and leadership. Um, they will provide you this information because really the benefits of, of reporting is to help identify increased areas of risk. And once everyone has that on their radar, they can make it better. Um, or they can be aware and give you support in other ways. Or it's something that's a long-term goal, but it's it's already, um, the awareness is there um, and perhaps there could be some correction. Um, it highlights areas for system improvement. So share, if you know, share, um, report the injury, the incident. Um, it's protective for employees um, and it gives data to let us know um, what we need to do to get better at education and training and equipment. Um, and we wanna look at the patterns and the trends because they do change. Next slide, please. Okay, so the the question I really do love to ask the group, and I'm I'm going to ask if you can respond in the chat, is your physically demanding job making you stronger? Um, I've asked this question to stagehands on Broadway. Um, because you have a physical job, does that make you stronger? Um, and I get some very interesting answers. And we'd love to hear from you if you don't mind popping it into 
um, the chat. So we have a yes, we have a no, we have a whole bunch of no's. Um, it does not make us stronger. Um, we have a yes, yes. Um, as an EMT and Broadway stagehand, no. Um, we have a real mix here. Um, so we have great participation from an audience of, I mean, you are the boots on the ground people. Um, absolutely taking people up and down stairs. Okay. Um, another no. Um, one person wrote, it tests how strong you are. No. Um, ah, another interesting comment, creates the illusion of strength. Um, another one, no, EMT lifting is only a few minutes after many hours of just sitting and slouching. Oh my goodness, you must have heard me thinking about this before we started today. Thank you. So this participation is amazing. And really, you know, what we're learning from this as we hear from you and as we what we see out in the field is that it does not make you stronger per se. Um, you are using the muscles day to day, hopefully, um, but really it is it is testing what your strength is. Um, unless it was a regimented planned program, um, unless it was something that you knew exactly what you'd be doing on a daily basis, um, then you would be able to. Um, if you were doing the same thing every day and you had a fitness program that matched it, perhaps um, that could help to make you stronger. Um, but overall, what we find is that there's a lot of wear and tear on the body. And unless we really target specific areas, next slide, please, and the specific regimen, it's very difficult to, um, to get stronger from the work that you do. So we talk a lot about the steps to prevent injury and to promote health. Um, aerobic exercise is key. And someone earlier in the chat put something about sitting and sitting and then having to go and run and do a rescue. Think about the sprints that you do. Um, you're sitting, let's say, waiting for a call and your muscles are, you're in hip flexion, right? Your, your hips are bent and your knees are bent and you're, you know, on occasion you're moving and cracking things. But then suddenly you get a call and you need to sprint either down into the subway or go up the stairs in someone's home in a walk up or a private house um, or across the park, um, you know, wherever you are. Um, this is going from zero to 100 in in moments. And we are looking and we, we focus a lot. We talk about this kind of education. We're looking to help people not to get hurt because they're going from zero to 100. Um, so what that means is aerobic exercise and stretching and strengthening. And overall, it'll improve physical and mental health and it'll help to prevent injuries. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to pass the presentation over to my colleague, Michael Gormley, and he's going to be speaking about functional um, activity and work tasks. Uh, Michael? Good afternoon, everyone, and happy EMS week. Um, thank you, Arlette. Thank you, Dr. Glavina, um, for your presentations. I get the boring part. Um, and it just comes down to basic um, safety, flight on calls looking out for yourself, making sure that you get home um, safe at the end of the day. And first thing I want to talk about is egress entry into, uh, into the EMS rigs, uh, rear and side of ambulances. Um, when I started doing this first years ago, we didn't have the great stuff we have now. And the kneeling ambulances, the ones that, that the back lowers down, all the different handles we have. The reason that to put them there is for your safety. And we always say three points of egress, um, three points of entry into a rig when you're getting, especially holding a bag, especially holding onto a, a stretcher or helping somebody into the rig to step in. Um, we got to look out for ourselves. Um, also, when we are in transit, we stress strongly the use of the seat belts. Um, we stress strongly putting your equipment close by stuff that you need. If it's a medic, your 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 um, IV equipment close by your um, suction units. Anything that you need to take care of the patient while you're moving should be close by. Um, patient care while the ambulance is moving is very very difficult. Um, the the chances of getting hurt are I don't even know what the number is, but it's great when you think you're going through traffic, especially in the city. Or especially in rural areas, like ambulances in rural areas are moving faster. 
ambulance in the city are moving quite between lights, braking, accelerating, and you're getting bounced around. So we recommend that you have your seatbelts all, even in the rig, if they're provided at all times. Um, also, big thing, EMS safety. Awareness of your patient's mental status and opportunistic reactions of these people. They may be having the, the worst day of their life and they think you're the person causing this because the police handed them over to you. You're in uniform and they don't know where they're going. They want to get out of that rig and they're going to use whatever they can to hurt you or to get out. Um, recommend using the straps. Mike would recommend also if some things go bad, stop the rig and get out. You don't want to fight this person. You don't want to restrain them. This is going to get you hurt. Uh, we had a recent incident in the city where a young EMT got badly hurt, um, where the patient wasn't um, searched before they put into the rig. And I've seen as even as an ER nurse where people, patients come in, sometimes they have knives in their pockets. I've seen a steak knife, hammer, stuff like that. So always be, yes, correct. Thank you, Michael. Take the keys out of the rig. When you're leaving, um, so they can't take it. We have what well, probably one ambulance a day taken in, in this country. Um, so yeah, go back to the mental status. Next, next, please. So your assessment should include the totality of your surroundings. Um, this comes back to situational awareness. Where are you? What door did you come in? What stair did you use? Did you use the elevator? Is the elevator broken? Is there one elevator? Did you have to walk down a dark corridor, make two lefts, two rights? Try and remember which way you went. And then if you have to get out or when you leave and do a mirror image of what you're doing, um, communicate with your patient when you get there. Hi, how are you? My name is such and such. I'm an EMT or a medic. I'm here to take you to the hospital. Can you tell me what's wrong? See how they react. Um, if it's a diabetic, if it's a stroke patient, if it's a mental health patient, you have to make an a very, very rapid assessment on scene as to what you have. Of course, you're going to do your physical assessment. I'm not going to go over that with you because we all know how to do physical assessments. Um, but your physical assessment should also be the members in the room, the family members in the room also. How are they handling the situation? Um, can the patient assist? So what kind of transfer are you going to do? If the patient can go on a stair chair, sometimes if the patient can can walk if they have a you know an injured wrist, anything like that, a cold. See, see can they walk? maybe to the elevator, maybe to the stretcher, out of the room. Um, how do you decide this? Well, you talk to the patient. Hi, can you walk? And, and listen, I, we all know this stuff. And this is just awareness of what we already know. Um, you know, how do you decide how to get the patient out there? That's a decision between you and the patient or, or you and your partner. So communication between the patient and the EMS team is paramount. The communication between you and your partner um, you know, they all say, don't work with a partner that you can't work with. It, it's it's paramount that that you have a good partner, that you actually work together. Even if you don't like it, or you have to work together. You have to make decisions that are going to get you both home. Um, on a scene, if, you're, if your partner has a better handle of the patient, let them be in charge. If you're, if you're the shift leader or the team leader, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to say, hey, I'm in charge here. And the EMT knows the patient from before or from a different company. Let them deal with it. Um, clarify orders. Who's going to who's going to move here? Who's going to move there? Who's going to get the bags? Who's going to get the equipment? And also, we never leave our partner. Can we hear the next slide, please? Never leave your partner behind if it's in a bad situation. If it's a situation where you think it's okay, then maybe you can. But in a in a situation where you're like buried in a house someplace. And it can wait until later, leave it. Um, if, you, if you got your phone on the, on the ambulance seat, leave it there. If you forget a non-essential piece of equipment, leave it there, bring the patient to the equipment. Um, so what we have now in, when we're doing it is, is moving and lifting challenges. Um, you're raising the lower on the stretcher, if they're battery operated, if the battery dies, um, who gives the command, who's at the head, who's at the foot. Also loading and unloading the stretchers. Are you going to use um, a backboard? Are you going to use a scoop? Are you going to use a stretch, um, a sheet, sorry, um, or any assistive device that you may have? Are you going to use it? <clears throat> Transferring patients. Um, 
And this is in the hospital. You have the glide sheets, sort of the plastic bags that are inside the back door of the hospital. When you come in, a lot of them have them. Um, I know I've used them. They're great. It's like a big plastic bag. You know, you put, you put it underneath the patient, you slide them over. Um, of course, you have your long board, which is contraindicated now for, for spine injuries, but sometimes we have to use it. So you may have to use a spine board to pick a patient up and get them onto the stretcher, then remove it. Um, we use our scoops uh, and our stair chairs. They have wonderful stair chairs now. They're heavy, but they can climb up stairs by themselves, go down by themselves. So if you have to use a stair chair, if you have an older one, you have to use it for, for a short um, move, yes. The older ones, you have a greater chance of getting a lower back injury. The newer ones, of course, the handles are higher. So the, the equipment that's older, the least amount that you have to use it, the better off. And if it's broken, turn it in. You, you cannot be using broken stuff in an ambulance. It's got to be replaced out. Um, Again, we have patient removal from tight, awkward spaces. We normally find a patient stuck between the toilet and the bathtub. Um, they're heavy. They're barely conscious. They, they don't know where they are. What do we do? Sometimes you might have to call the fire department to take the toilet out. Depends on the, on the, on the situation. Depends on the, on the mental status of the patient. If it's a stroke and you're in a shorter time or it's a cardiac, you may have to pull the patient out. You may have to take your chances. Um, you know, protect them as much as you possibly can. But a broken arm sometimes or, or, or a sprain or, or a skin tear is minor compared to the fact that the patient might die if you can't get them out. So do a quick assessment, what you can do, how you can get them out in, in, in a relative hurry. And if you have to call the fire department, call another rig, do what you have to do. Local police, whatever, local plumber to get the hood out. I mean, if they're there. Um, then we have ex vehicle extrications. So vehicles now are safer. They crumple. They have multiple airbags, but um, getting them out of the vehicle, now you have an initial, additional problems with airbags that have failed to go off. You have electric vehicles now, the, the battery operated ones, they, that are all electric. What are you going to do with them? What kind of courses are you taking for this? Like, what are the dangers that you're going to have when you're taking these people out of the rig? Are you going to set something off? You're going to set off the airbags? Um, you know, if you have to call the fire department to chain in the in the, the airbags or, or or take them out, do whatever it has safely to, to, to protect yourself. If an airbag goes off and you have your head in front of it, right beside the patient, you may not be getting out. So, and that comes down to situational awareness again. Um, if there's there's a lot of courses out there too on vehicles, how and, and how to extricate patients from them, what kind of dangers are involved uh, with these vehicles. What to look out for um, compressed um, bumpers, you know, airbags that have failed to deploy that somebody hits it from the front or they're doing a battery cut and it sets it off. So you have to be watching for this constant communication. Next, please. All right. So prevent slips, trips, and falls. Scope your pad, your pad, I'm sorry, in large. Scope your pad, identify the challenges, and communicate. We just spoke about this major, major things. Um, look out for broken curbs. Ramps, broken sidewalks, ice, slippery surfaces, footwear that's that doesn't fit you properly. Your laces are open. You step on your lace, you you trip over because it's it's easier to sit on in the rig with them open. Tie them before you go to do your work. Um, moving the stretcher, the lead at the head is going to walk, and the partner moves. So, one is going to steer, one is going to push. Determine who it's going to be. If 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 you work it out that that the rear is going to push or steer, then that's the way it's going to be. But always communicate. Um, increase your focus while on scenes, while responding. Avoid your, your cell. Avoid radio use if you don't have to answer it for a couple of minutes. I mean, if it's an urgent call and, you're, and someone's checking on it, yes, definitely. But if it's something mundane, let it be. Strap your radio behind you. That comes out an extra strap, put it on your belt and leave it there. Um attention to the scene so what is going on if it's a car accident if it's a shooting if it's a stabbing if it's a if it's a collapse a collapse zone a fire and there's people or pets trapped in the in the in the, the, the building you're going to have a lot of people there very very excited they're going to maybe want to fight you you're not doing your job right why didn't you get here in time you cannot get involved in this you have one job to do number one is protect yourself of course same safety but it's to take care of the patient. We don't put ourselves in any area where if the patient's lying there, 
and there's four or five people lying on the ground beside them, we're not going to run in and start taking care. We're going to wait till the electric company gets there, fire department, we're going to shut off the scene. So even if you're first on the scene, you know, make sure that, that what you're getting into is not going to kill you. If it's electrical wires and water, if it's if it's fuel on the ground, chemicals, you know, anything that's there that can hurt you, you got to watch. Um, and again, we said don't split your team. Never split your team. On rough, bad situations, don't split up. Stay together. Next one, please. So, um, thank you. And Arlette, you're going to take over. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, as we get to uh, the wind down of this webinar, you know, um, really, we want to talk a little bit about safety culture. I know that term is overused, um, but what we're finding after doing several years of education on injury prevention and safety um, and, and really um, engaging with responders in a very uh, familiar way, we're, we're really getting the reinforcement that building a safety culture amongst peers and amongst managers and leadership is really the way for everyone to get on board with helping each other get safer. So the peer communication on the job is key, as Michael was referring to. And then afterwards, sharing reports of experiences and near misses. Uh, you know, the reason for these case reviews, you do them all the time, is to talk about what uh, was the remediation. Um, next slide, please. I think, yes. Um, and education on injury prevention. Um, this is a program that we have worked very hard to develop so that we can help uh, to prevent the severity of injuries that are incurred on the job and also the frequency. Um, you are in a high-risk profession as an EMT, as a paramedic. We know that, and we want to do whatever we can to help to bring that risk down. So um, the education is really where there is a void, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, speaking with your managers about concerns, either individually as in a group, and ask questions. Um, I know that people who are out in the field for 20 years, they still ask questions and they share their own challenges because um, they're new ones that crop up all the time. Um, it's really a partnership of leadership, of workers, everybody to build this con culture together. And we have a responsibility, even us as educators, you know, we have a responsibility to really try to prevent work-related injuries. Next slide, please. So today, you know, we really pared down um, a three-hour workshop that we deliver. And, you know, going into the next, um, our next year for our work, uh, we are going to be reaching out to you to offer three-hour, two-hour, one-hour, whatever workshop works. We find that hands-on hands-on work, hands-on labs, simulation labs are most effective. Uh, really doing the lifting in person, really pointing out uh, the body postures and the awkward twists. And, um, you know, as we saw in the initial picture, uh, the worker, he, the EMT was wearing a bag, they both were. And how does that impact on your center of gravity? How does that change the demand on your back and your knees? And what kind of a stance can you use in a situation like that? So there, these are just a couple of quick pictures of the program that we started at Mount Sinai um, to fill an educational void. Um, it really has helped. This is the feedback we've gotten that it's boosted the confidence and the knowledge and self-care, um, increasing awareness of injury risk and coming up with solutions in a relaxed environment rather than being doing it on the job, sharing strategies with one, one another for daily practice, and really very importantly to destigmatize the reporting on the job of injuries and and incidents. Um, I know people are concerned about, you know, being the squeaky wheel, but that's the only way we can create improvement. So um, certainly reach out to us, you know, if you have interest in education, further education. Um, one of our goals for this year also, we're happy to say that we're going to be going into the educational programs and really introducing injury prevention at a very early age. So it's part of the way cognitive process develops and the muscle memory um, when people are going out into the field for the first time. So in closing, thank you for having us today. Um, we're going to put up a QR code and um, Corey's gonna put a link in the chat just in case you're on your phone so that you can complete um, a very quick survey, three minutes. Um, this will also get you your CME credit. 
And then we will move on to Q&A, which Khalid will be moderating. Great, thank you so much, Selikoff team. I sincerely appreciate you guys taking the time for this. I know the time just sort of flew by. Uh, like Arlet had mentioned, this is actually a piece of a longer course that uh, Selikoff has been developing in partnership with us. Uh, so uh, what we have found is lectures are great. We love lectures. Um, oh, okay. Maybe some of us will like lectures, but the reality of the situation is EMS providers, uh, historically, we're, we're guys that move. We like to be hands-on. We like to be out there. So sitting and watching presentations is great. You get that sort of fundamental information, but then how do you put it together? And that's unfortunately the piece that we can't really roll out in a virtual setting, which is something that Arlette and her team have been working on regionally to see if we could bring it uh, out there. Uh, they've done a few courses up in Westchester. They've done quite a few courses for us. We, we're, they're constantly reaching out to different EMS agencies to see how they can bring in sort of almost a tailor-made, custom-made uh, injury prevention course, injury reduction course, whatever title you want to give it. The idea being, hey, let's, let's start teaching our EMS providers the best practices in lifting and moving in uh, just general operations. So uh, just to circle back to the case we had talked about earlier uh, with that crew, uh, especially, specifically that provider, you know, we, we spoke to him, uh, you know, I re he was very honest, very forthcoming about with us about, hey, you know, I was in an awkward position, I was sort of dragging, and we sort of reinforced some key points, right? You know, if you have that extra weight on your back as you're trying to do a reach and a pull, that's going to shift your balance. That's going to shift some of that pressure onto muscle masses that you don't want pressure on. And then when you're trying to make that motion and now that patient suddenly goes dead weight on you, you're now trying to compensate. But if you, let's say your back was a little bit free, maybe you could have done a little bit better, but now you have a bag sort of dragging you down along with the patient. That's something we have to think of. And it's not a blame game. It's the idea that, you know, we operate on this idea of, hey, we got to go, we got to go, we got to rush, we got to move, we got to do this. And what, you know, Michael, Arlette, Dr. Glovina have been really emphasizing is that we need to protect ourselves to be able to do this job effectively. And sometimes that means you got to take a pause. You got to take a beat. You got to reassess. See, is this the smartest way or is this the best way to accomplish our goal? So uh, what I'd love to do is seeing that we have these three experts here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please throw it in the chat. Let's take a look, see if anyone uh, has any thoughts, even comments about you know, the job out there and the longevity of us, you know, how many EMS providers do we see make it past 10 years, 15 years, 20 years plus, right? So would love to hear some thoughts from the crowd out there. We have, wow, 130 people. You guys really want to learn about lifting. And be, just one quick thing, um, sorry, Khalid, but before sure. um, before we hop into the q and just want to remind everyone to please complete the survey. Um, my email box is blowing up, but I only have about 25 of you so far. So please keep completing them so that we can get you your CU certificates, your CME certificates. Thank you. Sorry, Khalid. Yes. Yeah, so Yisheng, I do see you in the chat. I am not a doctor, which is my dad's biggest disappointment. So <laughs> feel free. <laughs> All right. I'm getting a lot of thank yous. Sincerely appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, the Selkoff team has provided their contact information. Actually, just one slide over. There we go. There we go. We got the contact information there. Please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, they do. They are willing to work with you on trying to identify grant funding for your programs. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, these folks really want to uh, work with our industry as a whole, work with EMS as a whole to uh, bring down those injury rates, to make sure we have healthy providers out there being able to provide this care. And, you know, it's nice when folks outside of our field uh, acknowledge, hey, you guys have a tough job, right? Uh, we do have the luxury of Michael, you know, he's a volunteer firefighter upstate. He understands how EMS works a bit. And then what Arlette 
does great is she just asks a ton of questions. She's not blowing us off. She wants to know what we she can do or what the team can do to really improve this. And then we have Dr. Globina really steering the ship along, making sure that you know we have this evidence-based research and evidence-based methodology to make sure we're teaching you guys the right way. So please feel free to reach out to them. And oh, we got a question. Are you seeing that modern tech, which leads to less actual lifting than we did 10 years ago, lead to more injuries when actual lifting is needed? You want to expand on that, Drew? Just curious. Are you seeing something like using a track chair or using a power loading system? Do you think that's contributing to more injuries when we have to do lifting because we're not really lifting as much? Just want to make sure I'm phrasing it correctly. Yep. Okay. I'll turn it to my panel. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. And um, I get asked that question in the nursing community quite often because there's a lot of safe patient handling equipment out there. But then there'll be that time that um, either there's disrepair in the equipment, it's not working, or they have to um, do something that's a little bit different and it doesn't work with the equipment. It's safer to do it manually. Um, this is what goes back to the idea of being more physically fit and really um, that equipment doesn't take the place of the engagement of your body with the equipment. Um, you asked if we're seeing um, more injuries, um, if people are turning to um, when they have to do a manual um, type of lift. I don't know that we've refined the data that specifically. But what I do know is that um, when we become reliant on the equipment, um, then our expectation is not to be as strong. And this is where um, <laughs> this is where, you know, I, I do believe that, um, you know, we are going to we've, we've started to in our labs, in our simulation labs, we have a section where we get on the floor and we actually do core strengthening. Um, we do. Um, you know, and, and we're looking to expand that because um, at least to have a foundation of strength and flexibility, we talk a lot about movement. I know someone said sprinting. Really? We sprint? Um, we've had uh, many providers talk about, you know, sitting um, for an hour or two, really not moving and then having to move and really feeling achy or feeling it the next day or getting a spasm in their hip flexor or in their low back. Um, so, you know, one point I, I do want to reinforce in response to both both of you is um, the idea of movement. Um, besides strengthening and stretching, um, intermittently throughout the day, keep moving. Um, even get out, get out of the rig, and stand up and shake out your feet and do some weight shifts and jog in place. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but as you know from the research in general about um, physical health, intermittent exercise is actually most effective um, as opposed to just doing it for an hour at the end of the day. Um, so if you can do that, of course, it's not always possible. Um, if you're parked on the West Side Highway, that may not be possible. But if you're in a place where you can get out and stand and jog in place, weight shift, uh, move, um, do a little stretch uh, right where you are, that would be terrific. And then certainly um, whatever core strengthening you can do would be essential. And then learning what the best body postures are, um, as we do in our workshop, where, you know, we talk, it's not just about you know, bending at the knees anymore. Um, you know, I don't use the term body mechanics that way. Um, it's best body postures. It is mechanics, which is under that umbrella. Um, and it also has to do with the kind of stance you're using. But if you don't have the strength to support that, then the risk goes up. Thank you for that, Arlette. Uh, we have a few comments. Uh, People basically saying that exercising, not exercising enough is pretty much the main problem, along with diet issues of eating, you know, foods rich in saturated fats and simple sugars. I had someone point out that some of the best exercises we can do are deadlifts. And then uh, it's a person posing a question, I guess, generally, which is the practicality of agencies to provide free gym memberships to employees. 
So it seems a lot of the conversation centering around the exercising piece of it. And, you know, uh, just uh, this is a comment for me, the non-expert, which is it, I do believe that's true, that we haven't really developed a very good culture of, hey, we need to exercise for this job. We look at our firefighter counterparts, the suppression folks, right? They take pride in trying to stay fit, especially when you're young and a probie. You're expected to be, you know, uh, hitting the weights, you know, doing the cardio. But, and again, not making excuses here, but what I'm saying is it's almost built into their job to be able to do that while on duty versus us where our system is poorly designed. I have no problem for really saying that, that we are forced to sit on street corners, which is why our let's recommendation is great, which is, you know, step out, try to do these small, you know, routine exercises, as opposed to waiting till the end of the day when you're exhausted, you've done either a double shift or just a packed eight, 12 hour shift. And now you're telling yourself, well, I got to drag myself to do a one hour routine to really get into shape. Some of you have that discipline and God bless you. I can tell you that I am one that did not have that discipline at all after my shift i wanted to decompress relax just mentally decompress but yeah you're right physically that's not doing me any benefits which is why we have you know folks like the selikoff center working with us to identify all right so what else can we do what what sort of small tools can we provide you guys to uh become a bit more flexible right to identify what maybe you need to work on uh can i, can I have one thing yeah. you don't mind um, you just reminded me as you were, um, I was having this this image of um, someone going in to get their lunch and their partner staying in the ambulance. And then I was thinking, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention about the buddy system. So when we talked about culture earlier, um, one of the strongest influencers of people remembering to move, stretch and strengthen is if they're partners, if they have an understanding between partners that it's OK to say, hey, we got to move. Um, so that if you're so engaged in your work, which you are, and you're so busy or just recovering from call to call and, or just, it's, you know, it's just one after the other, that as a pair, um, you can remind one another, Hey, let's, let's do a quick stretch. Let, let's get out for a minute and, and move just for 30 seconds. And that has been, um, impactful, uh, where people speak to each other and that feeds right into the safety culture. Thank you, Colleen. Yep. And just to sort of wrap up that exercise piece, uh, what's interesting with the injury data that we review, and again, this is more specific to Mount Sinai, but I'm sure if we looked at the other health systems in the fire department, we may possibly be seeing the same thing, is a good chunk of the injuries is not due to a lack of strength, it's due to poor mechanics. So the example, the case we just covered, right? That was a moderately fit person. I, that individual I know for a fact does exercise. He has a routine, but it was due to a poor decision just at the time, impulsive, right? Poor mechanic reaching over, uh, you know, uh, unbalanced weight and then trying to pull it over. And then the patient suddenly goes limp on you. That's a good frequency of the injuries that we're seeing out there, which is why I don't like pointing fingers and saying the general problem is no one exercises. And it is a problem in our field. I'm not denying that. But we also have to acknowledge, all right, what are we doing in the heat of the moment? You know, how are we positioning ourselves? How are we communicating with each other and timing our lists and moves? What I'd like to ask the group, actually, which I think would be valuable information for our let and the rest of them is, how many of you have spent more than one skill session in your EMT program going over lifting and lifting and moving? More than one. So I'm just curious. Go ahead and throw in the chat. Hmm. Yali yeah, says just the one. So in uh, to clear that question up, Perez, in your EMT program, how many sessions are spent on lifting and moving? How many skill sessions? I'm getting a lot of just once. Zero. Yep. One, one, one. There we go. I think that's a problem right there, right? That, yeah, our job is clinical in nature. And I, we emphasize that here at Sinai too, that we want to practice the medicine, but we can't deny the reality that our job involves a huge physical component where we're the ones in charge of moving that patient. You know, within the hospital, you might have a team of people, you know, the patient care techs and nurses working together to move a patient. Sometimes it's just you and your partner. 
and 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I see folks. And so I'm, I'm in the 20 year club. Right. And same thing. I had one skill session teaching me how to move a patient. And I think that's a big problem, which I'm very grateful that Arlette, Michael and Dr. Globina are trying to address, uh, you know, come up with better lifting mechanics for our industry and how we can sort of develop, include that along with the other trainings involved. Uh, I did see a quick question. I, I blew past it. I apologize, Michael Song. I know you were asking something earlier. Uh, giving me oh, um, I like to stretch for ten minutes before uh, before bed before I go to sleep. Any suggestions, resources for good stretches to prevent injury? I'm gonna leave that to Michael and Arlette. So, um, if you haven't had an injury. You know, if, if you've been in under the care of a therapist and they've made recommendations for when you need to do your stretches and how many times a day, I would follow that protocol. Um, generally, um, we're not, we're looking at a warm up before activity and a wind down at the end of the day. So it's really more of a gentle regimen. Um with a group of 125, it's really difficult to make a blanket recommendation. Um, but I think, especially with your job, um, that uh, the wind down and really letting your, I have some people that lie down on the floor and just let their spine align and they just let everything go back into neutral. And that's not an aggressive stretch. That's really just going back to neutral posture. And oftentimes that's the best place to start your night's sleep with, um, unless you get a recommendation from a physician or from a therapist. It's a great question um, because everybody has a different pre-bed routine, um, but that alignment, neutral posture, just letting it go, letting everything just go into a relaxation mode is um, highly recommended. Okay, great. I hope that thoroughly answered the question there. I perfect. Dead hangs, please. Uh, so, uh, one of our paramedics, Dave Perez, did say, "Could you uh, touch on footwear and support, and I guess the importance of it?" Oh, Michael, you can talk about your shoelace um, <laughs> yes. session. Um, and Colleen, so if you want to speak to what you do in your department, that may be helpful. Oh, our, in our department, we make recommendations. So we do not issue footwear. Uh, so our recommendation is always strong ankle support, composite toe. Those are like the two big ones. Good traction because you're going from one different surface to another. Uh, this is a personal, not a Mount Sinai recommendation, but I've been wearing a Hakes, H-A-I-X. Uh, they're, I believe, European boots that were designed for their firefighters out there. Uh, I usually get them as factory seconds because I cannot afford them as original price, but I've had the same pair now for about seven, eight years. Uh, and what I looked for was that slip resistant, good traction on the foot, uh, good ankle support, composite toe. And I'm not going to lie to you guys. I went with the zipper option because I love taking my boots off and airing out my feet and pissing off my partner. So. And Michael, a safety tip, please. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say um, the Higgs boots. And there's a lot of manufacturers out there that make really good. Like, again, 511, like Anthony said. I do own a couple of pairs. I don't remember what the names of them are, but what I did was sit down with the, the person selling them. It was at one of the fire shows. And I went through many, many sets of boots and said, wow, I really like these. Um, so you may have to pay a little bit more, um, but use what is there. If there's laces there, use them, tie them up because the problem is they'll they'll help you. And number one, from stepping on tripping over, but number two, to help to support your ankles and to help you do your job. You know, you can't be sliding down a set of stairs and sliding out of your boots at the same time because they're, they're, um, hanging around your, your, you know, behind your ankles. One of the worst things I hate to see when I'm working in emergency room is people come in with their boots open, laces five feet behind them. Um, that boot, you may as well just go to Walmart and buy whatever cheapest pair of, of shoes you can find and wear them. You want to protect yourself, buy decent ones and take them off. Like, um, like Khalid said, take them off once in a while. If you know you got some time, um, that's a nightmare special on lace boots. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sometimes it days too. Um, but, you know, take the boots off, relax your feet, bring a spare set of socks, 
do that if, if you sit in a rig put a set of pair of spare set of socks in your um in your in your bag that you carry with you but definitely protect the feet um because you only have two of them and if you get a, a, an ulcer or any of that or if you're diabetic and you get an ulcer you may not be may not be curable look out for yourself and again thank you for um everyone for being here today it was great seeing so many people show up i hope we could help you out a little bit and like i said we're available to career and volunteer um we can travel i live up in orange county york we've gone up into sullivan county we've gone to westchester um our email addresses are here so if you need to contact us please do we will answer you back and um again so i'm going to hand back to arlette but thank you all okay now yeah, we're very glad everyone came today and and just a moment to pay tribute to you all for the work that you do uh there's not a day that i don't go by after having worked with khalid now since 2019 and thinking yeah. that um, the risk that's involved in your day-to-day -day activity is high. And I have a deep appreciation for all of you. So thank you for your service, really. And thank you for coming today. We'll hopefully have more in the series. So if you have ideas, please include that in the survey or get in touch with Khalid. He'll feed the information back to us. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thank just want to... I want to thank Dr. Globina, Arlette, and Michael, and basically the whole Selikoff crew for doing this. And this is what we need. We need the experts in the field to start moving this forward, as opposed to hearing the 20-year medic tell you how he used to do it back in the day. Not anymore. We're doing evidence-based stuff, and I really appreciate the experts working with us on this. Take care, folks.